was a glorious stroke maker, perfectly balanced at the crease. He was an icon, an inspiration for his people. He overcame racism and the tyranny of distance to achieve greatness. Intelligent, astute and graceful, George Headley is one of ESPN's legends of cricket. In 1932, playing against a touring English first-class team, George Headley played what observers called the perfect innings, 344 not out. In 1932, um, Lord Tennyson, the former England Test captain, brought a team to Jamaica and to the West Indies, and Headley slaughtered them. Um, he started, he scored an innings of 344 not out and it, it's been described by those who saw it as the perfect innings. In the series, he, in the matches against the Tennyson side, he, he scored 723 runs, uh, was only dismissed twice, lowest score 84, an average of 361 and a half. Uh, Tennyson, the captain, described it as being just the innings as of perfection and he also commented that uh, Headley throughout that series just should um, display the, a complete variety of strokes. I would imagine that George Headley in 1932 was a batsman as unlikely to be dismissed as any cricketer in the history of the game. Headley was a small, finely constructed man who hit the ball with great power. A little man, tiny man, but he had that, the eye, George Headley's eyes had something, had a sparkle. Most of the top batsmen have got great eyes. Their, their eyes give, you know, show something in, in there and, and you can recognise that something is, that makes them different. I only know what uh, Grimmett has said and what Bradman has said about uh, George Headley that he was one of the greatest players the world's ever seen. Older West Indians say that he was the best ever from uh, the West Indies and uh, I can believe them. I've only seen things of him on television, so I can't go into any detail on that, but people I trust say, look, that guy was absolutely magnificent. He was very strong in every direction. His defence was splendid. He had a full range of shots, played a hook shot, and was particularly strong on the onside. Um, Clary Grimm had always said that he thought George Headley one of the greatest players that he ever bowled to. And of course, Clary bowled to all the great players of that era, so his opinion ought to be respected. I, I rate George very highly indeed. In Australia, his prolific run-getting earned him the title of the Black Bradman. They called him the Black Bradman. Somebody called, said well, Bradman was the Black... Uh, the, he, was, he was the White Headley. <laughs> It's a well-documented story about uh, you know Headley being the Black Bradman in the Caribbean. They used to say, "No, no, Bradman is is the uh, is the White Headley," and you know they were quite serious about it. They obviously uh, rated uh, George Head George Headley uh, very highly, and when you look at his record uh, pre-war, exceptional. In his demeanour at the wicket, he was quite like Bradman. Um, a, a compact figure. He moved his feet very quickly, played off the back foot a lot, but was capable of coming down the wicket. Very attractive, wristy, uh, more attractive than Bradman to watch, more graceful uh, and stylistic uh, than Bradman, um, and very effective, a, a great deflector of the ball. His statistics alone uh, emphasise that he was a great batsman. He played in the 1930s when the West Indies had first come into Test cricket. He wasn't. Uh, surrounded by any player who was of note so he had to carry the batting on his own he was known as atlas in the caribbean because of that fact he carried the batting on his shoulders and he averaged um, just over 60 in test cricket and between 1928 when the west indies first came into test cricket and 1939 when the war broke out the west indies uh, had scored 22 test hundreds all told and he had scored 10 of them so he really was the dominant batsman and um, People refer to him as a black Bradman. West Indians refer to Bradman as a white Headley.
Panama-born George Headley might have been a dentist in America had he not become smitten with the game of cricket. In 1927, uh, the great English batsman um, Ernest Tilsley came to um, the West Indies on a, a tour and he was actually injured in a car accident uh, midway through that tour but in the first three matches he scored a hundred in every game and in Jamaica uh, he, where he got those runs uh, Headley saw him bat and Headley commented years later that he watched every ball and it was the way apparently that he said he watched every ball there's no doubt that Headley was a very keen observer of, uh, of other cricketers and it's shown in his career that he learnt very very quickly as to what to do Selected for Jamaica at the age of 18, Headley made 211 in his second match. Despite his obvious talent, he was overlooked for the West Indian team to tour England in 1928. The uh, West Indies played their first test matches in 1928 in England, and they decided that Headley was too young. Uh, they paid for that by losing all three tests that they played by an innings and decided that he probably wasn't too young after all. The West Indies uh, went to England in 1928 and you can just imagine the politics of trying to, uh, to pick the side when the selectors sit down and they've got a, all their the class prejudices, they've got to pick their, uh, if you like, their fellow whites. They've also got to fit in players from the different islands. It would have been almost impossible for a, a teenage black Jamaican, Jamaica being so far from the, the centre of West Indies cricket at the time, which was uh, more centred around Barbados and Trinidad. Um, it would have been almost impossible for a, a black Jamaican to make the side and hence despite Headley's undoubted talent he, he did miss out and didn't go on that tour in 28 and that's why he then uh, didn't make his test debut until when Calthorpe's team came out in 1930 but then when he did make his test debut the impact he had was, uh, was immediate and phenomenal. On his debut in Barbados against England Headley made 176 he came into the test match in Barbados, got, um, I think it was 60 or 70 in the first innings and then, then 100 in his very first test match. And then he went on to, to Guyana, got hundreds there. And from that moment, you know that Headley was going to be a, a great player. In the final test at home in Jamaica, Headley made 223 to save the match, becoming the youngest batsman to score a test match double century. Uh, as soon as he got into the side, which was probably a bit belated. Uh, Headley did very well. He scored 176 in his first test, which was against England early in 1930. He scored a lot more runs in that series and he, he rounded it off in the last test with 223 in the fourth innings in a match that had to be left drawn because England, it was supposed to be a timeless test, but England had to get the boat home, so they left it as a draw with Headley on. I think he'd just been out for 2-2-3. He was the, uh, at the time, the youngest uh, player to score a double century in test cricket. Uh, the, the first teenager, I think Javid Mandad, then broke that record in uh, around 1976. Um, he also, he's still, that's still at 223, he's still the largest score by a, a cricketer in the fourth innings of a test match. Uh, and for a bloke to achieve this in his first series is quite extraordinary. To the black masses throughout the Caribbean, he had become a hero. He's revered by all Jamaicans in Caribbean society of his era. Uh, it was hard to make your harder to make your way to the top than it was if you were uh, born the right colour and you know and fairly wealthy. So he was a he was a real working man's hero. I don't think we can underrate Headley's impact and importance to the history of Jamaican cricket. Uh, I think that for the modern cricket fan to see the influence of uh, cricketers such as Sir Vivian Richards and Andy Roberts on the growth of cricket in Antigua, um, Headley is a similar figure to um, Jamaican cricket. Uh, he was, for the people of the island, the cricketers, black, white, whatever, I mean, Headley was the, the game's first superstar there. But especially for the, the black lower classes to have a hero such as George Headley. And he was that hero from the moment he scored uh, a double century against England. In 1931, the West Indies travelled to Australia to face a team brimming with confidence after Bradman's triumphs on the 1930 tour of England. Two players made more than 1,000 first-class runs that season, Don Bradman and George Headley. It was during this series Headley was dubbed 
the Black Bradman. George Headley uh, had a fine tour, did very well, and uh, subsequently improved on that form as his career unfolded. And history would undoubtedly uh, rank George Headley as one of the all-time great batsmen, and he, he was certainly a great player. Uh, George Headley was known uh, by some people as the Black Bradman, um, but people in West Indies prefer to call Bradman the White Headley. And in 1931, they both came up, up against each other when West Indies toured Australia, and both did very well. Uh, it was probably a, a score draw between the two. They were both pretty fine players. Headley had arrived in Australia as a predominantly offside batsman, and Australian leg spinner Clary Grimmett had a plan. He scored 100 in Melbourne against Victoria in, in an early tour match. And after that game, Hugh Trumbull, who was a former Australian cricketer and was the secretary of the Melbourne Cricket Club, said it was one of the best hundreds that he'd ever seen. But then word got out, the Australian team, Woodfall was the Victorian captain, and word got out that they worked out how to bowl to Headley. And Grimmett was, Clary Grimmett was their key, and he concentrated on Headley's leg stump. And Headley hardly scored a run in the first two tests. But then in the third test, he realised he had to teach himself how to play on the leg side, and most specifically to get an on-drive. So he went into the nets and he just practised and practised and practised. And there are quotes from his teammates saying that uh, he would practise for hours and hours just learning how to play the on-drive. And so he came out for the third test and scored 100. And it was recognised as one of the best hundreds that the, the critics had seen. And by the end of the series, Grimmett himself and uh, Herbert Johnny Moyes, who was a leading Australian journalist at the time, and uh, Herbert Collins, the former Australian captain, all said that Headley was the best onside player that they'd ever seen. At the end of the, the tour, he was considered uh, one of the best onside players they'd seen. He was adaptable. Um, you, you see pictures of him, still pictures. I've only seen a little bit of cli uh, clips of him. But uh, he went right back. He used the crease. When he pulled, he pulled with his uh, back foot almost be behind the stumps. And when he went forward, he went right forward. And that's the hallmark of a, a really a great player. But uh, he dominated West Indies cricket. And of course, uh, he led the way for the great batsmen who were to follow. In 1935, England toured the West Indies for the second time. The first test was played on a substandard pitch, with Headley and Hammond playing extraordinary knocks in a low-scoring match. He was almost at his best on wet wickets. Headley uh, was a man of extraordinary ability when things were, were difficult. I think he's probably up there with Hammond and, and might even have been a better bat than Hammond. There's been a comparison done between Headley and Bradman on wet wickets, um, uh, which showed that uh, of uh, on 13 innings on wet wickets, Headley got 57 times. Bradman had played 14 innings on wet wickets and got 50 once. Bradman on wet wickets uh, wasn't overly successful. Headley, Headley on wet wickets had to be the um, had to be the man. And so his record on wet wickets is quite extraordinary. And there are a number of people who saw Headley on wet wickets say he was the greatest wet wicket player ever. And these people would have seen Hobbs on wet wickets and Hammond on wet wickets. And yet they suggest that Headley was number one. With the series level, Headley made 270 not out in the last test in Jamaica. The West Indies won the match and the series. The first series win by a West Indian team against England. And their spearhead, George Headley, had become a folk hero. Headley, I, I imagine, gave West Indies cricket a self-belief. They were not a great side when they started playing tests in 1928. When Headley came into the side, they started competing with England and Australia on a more even keel. So uh, they still lost more often than they won, but thanks to Headley, they were much more competitive. So he probably, he probably started the, the West Indian revolution for cricket, which is still going on now. For the 1939 tour of England, many believe that George Headley should be the West Indian captain. It's a shame he couldn't have been captain earlier. I think he knew an enormous amount about the game. He knew everything about the game. Uh, West Indies cricket politics stopped him from being captain uh, when you know he probably could have made his biggest contribution to the game. His contemporaries, to a man, suggest he would have been a superb captain. Um, and just 
he became a statesman after he retired, so he clearly had the ability to um, communicate with his, um, his teammates. And the fact that he was such a great observer of opposition players, which he then applied to his own cricket, suggests that he would have been a, an excellent tactician as well. England won the series, but Headley was now universally recognised as one of the world's greatest batsmen. He was known as Atlas because of the way he carried the West Indian side. George Headley was also known as Atlas, which quite simply because he was, um, it was recognised that he carried the uh, West Indies cricket world on his shoulders. He was as clear-cut an example in, in cricket history of a man carrying his side. The closest recent analogy I could think of would be Richard Hadley carrying the New Zealand bowling attack or perhaps Alan Border with the Australian batting in the 80s. But I think George Hadley was more so than either of those. He really was the ultimate one-man band. Within days of the series ending, the world was at war and George Hadley's greatest days were over. After the war, George Headley was made captain for the 1948 home series against England, an extraordinary achievement for a black cricketer. It was a great honour for, for somebody black in those days because, um, you know, we, they probably thought that probably, they, they, you know, we didn't, the leaders, the, the black people were not very good leaders and, um, and for, for him to, to be elevated to that position was a, a landmark for, for West Indies cricket. In 1954, Headley, who had been coaching and playing league cricket in England, came home for his last test. Headley's status as a, as a, a man and as a cricketer in Jamaica is, is still around. The, the main grandstand in Sabina Park is the George Headley stand. And the, probably the greatest example of just how, how highly he's regarded there uh, came in uh, the 53-54 series when Headley had been playing league cricket in England and hadn't played a test match since 1948. The public in Jamaica actually had an appeal to try and get him back to uh, the Caribbean to play in the series in 1953-54 against uh, Len Hutton's side, even though at that time he was 45 and uh, coaching and playing league cricket in England. There was a public subscription which raised over a thousand pounds and they brought him back to play in that series, but of course at the age of 45 he really was past his best. But that gives an illustration of the regard in which he was held and uh, the quality of the player that he was. All who met the great man were left with a lasting impression. I met George in 81 and I'm so glad that I did. I spent the day with him in Bridgetown watching a test match. He had a great sense of humour but he also had a, a sense of fair play and one of the English uh, batsmen, Gower or Willie, was given out to a patently poor decision and George said to me, man, that spoils it for me. And I was impressed by that because it showed that unlike everyone around us, he wasn't uh, being one-eyed about it. He, he cherished cricket. Um, cricket had given him a lot and he'd given a lot to cricket. Once I started talking to him for a couple of minutes, you could tell that he was a wise old man. That, that he was going to tell me probably something that would be beneficial as far as cricket was concerned but also something that was beneficial as far as life was concerned. George is a very nice guy. He's had uh, sons and grandsons playing English county cricket, but a uh, very nice guy and uh, extremely modest about his own performances. He was never one to speak too loudly, never one to speak of himself. If you got him on a quiet moment, he would tell you a little bit about the cricket that he played and about the fast bowlers that he came across and that sort of a thing. But he was very quiet, very soft-spoken. He was a member of my club in Jamaica, Melbourne Cricket Club, along with Lucas, another, another club. And he spent a lot of time at Melbourne, and he was a good friend of my father. So I had close contact with him at the club. As a matter of fact, I got an award from him once at a Melbourne presentation. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but young, teen, young teens. And when he presented the award, someone took the picture of him presenting me with that award. And a couple of weeks later on, he presented me with a picture. And on the back of the picture, he had written, play cricket and see the world. 
Headley died in 1983, remembered as one of the finest batsmen of any era, and the man who carried West Indian cricket in those difficult early years. Headley was the first of the great West Indies batsmen. He set the pattern for those who followed, so that after the war, in the inter-territorial tournaments back home. You had the three W's coming through, you had J.K. Holt from Jamaica. He set the example, George Headley, and the rest then followed. So he was the one who led the way. George Headley played 22 test matches, scoring 2,190 runs. He averaged 60.83. Only Don Bradman and Graham Pollock finished with higher averages. Leaving out his three post-war tests, his average was 64.7. He earned his nickname Atlas for scoring 10 of the first 14 centuries made by West Indian batsmen. And in the 35 innings in which he batted before the war, he top scored on 15 occasions. I still regard him as probably the greatest West Indian batsman for the simple reason that he didn't have the support that later great batsman from the Caribbean had. He did it almost single-handed and he made um, 10 test centuries in 20 test matches. Unfortunately he came back after the war when he was past it but if you look at his record during the 1930s, late 20s to the war, he was fantastic. He, he made 100 in each innings in a test at Lords against a good England attack. Very small man, nimble on his feet, uh, big appetite for runs um, and to get to meet him and, and to for once not to be let down because often you meet the great performers and they do disappoint you but uh, I'm proud of that day I spent with George. If you look at cricket writings whether it be CLR James or Cardus or whatever people wrote a lot about Headley because there was a lot to say. He was uh, invigorating for his audience. Crowds loved George Headley. Remember the West Indies didn't have a lot of international cr cricket then so his exposure was limited but his record stands testimony alongside anybody really except the Don. He was very proud of West Indies and West Indies should be proud of him because he put him on the map, he and Leary Constantine, and uh, they never looked back. Had he played in the modern era, he would certainly have been the West Indian captain and he would have played many more test matches. But a strong case can be argued that of all the glorious batsmen to have graced West Indian cricket, George Headley was the greatest for his talent, his intelligence and his grace in the face of injustice. George Headley is one of ESPN's Legends of Cricket.